100 years ago, one of the boldest feats of engineering ever envisaged was conceived in one of the most remote corners of the world. Over the next century, Tasmania's hydroelectric power scheme would be carved out of the state's harsh interior by ordinary people working in extraordinary conditions. Thousands of people, many displaced by hard economic times, war and strife, came from all over the world, not only to help build a mighty power scheme, but to make Tasmania their home. This is the story of a towering ambition, of technical innovation, ingenuity and sheer bloody determination in a rugged and often dangerous environment. It's a tale of communities born, changed and sometimes divided, and the opening up of a small island state to the rest of the world. Above all, it's the story of the people who made it happen. In 1916, official openings were done in style. Remarkably, film of the grand opening of Watamana, Tasmania's first hydropower station, survives. Water pours through the sluice gates of Myena Dam, down canals dug out by hand to the Penstock Lagoon, then is dropped down through timber Penstock pipes and fed into the turbines of the brand new Watamana station. It is no less a figure than Australia's Governor General, Sir Ronald Crawford Munro Ferguson, who is given the honour of turning the valve to the station's turbines. Few of those in attendance would have understood the enormity of the achievement they witnessed. Unseen that day were the hundreds of workers who completed the Watamana scheme, felling trees, blasting rock, pouring concrete, all by hand at a time when industrial machinery was a far-off reality. The genesis of Tasmania's hydropower system was a handful of people with a grand vision. Mathematician and physicist Professor Alexander Macaulay and landowner Harold Bisdy tramped and surveyed the rugged central highlands of Tasmania, seeing in the terrain the potential for hydropower. In 1905, Macaulay outlined his vision in a letter to the Hobart Mercury. Nature, he said, has practically made us a present of the whole scheme. Industry too was excited by the idea, with metallurgist James Hines Gillies needing bulk electricity for his patented electrolytic process to convert complex ores into zinc. At the beginning of it, uh, in the world, there were only four countries generating hydroelectric power. They were very expensive schemes, and this one was going to be incredibly cheap and right at the cutting edge of um, technology at that time. It's described as being nature's gift to Tasmania, that this hydroelectric scheme was there for the taking. His vision was that it should be owned by the people. And his vision started uh, with his process. He really wanted to do his process. So Gillies was empowered to go to England and raise the necessary capital. He had to raise 145,000 pounds. But such a massive undertaking was never going to be easy. Work commenced and the winter of 1912 was absolutely appalling. The worst weather conditions ever recorded in Tasmania. The appalling weather, coupled with transport problems and union trouble, plunged the company into serious financial difficulty. Gillies clashed with local businessmen and politicians and his grip on the private company weakened. He ended up broke, bankrupt. A engineer from New Zealand came over, looked at the works and the scheme and recommended to the government that they take it over. So on October 23rd, 1914, Gillies Hydroelectric Power and Metallurgical Company became the new government-owned Hydroelectric Department. The department completed work on the Watamana station in 1916. It was the start of a renewable energy scheme that would become the envy of the nation and provide the island's power needs for the next hundred years. The old Watamana power station still stands. Today it's a museum, visited by locals, tourists and countless Tasmanian schoolchildren as a reminder of where it all began.
No roads led to Tasmania's remote central highlands in the early 1920s, which were then virtually unexplored. New employees were expected to arrive on foot. Equipment was brought in via the horse-drawn Redgate wooden tramway, carved by hand through 20 kilometres of bush, a feat of transport engineering for its day. By 1921, 1,800 men had made the journey for a job that paid eight shillings a day, together with a tent and a sack of straw for bedding. It was tough and lonely work, suffering long hours, harsh weather, and taking an enormous physical toll. When it snowed or rained, you couldn't work. There'd be a big frost and you wouldn't be able to get your tools out of the toolbox. They'd be stuck to the bottom. On your days off, you'd just sit in the camp. You couldn't go nowhere because it was too wet or there was snow up to your knees. In the summertime, it wasn't so bad if you could keep the snakes out and the march flies away. Over the next 30 years, the Watamana and Shannon stations were joined by expanding schemes of canals, flumes and penstocks, which spread from the central highlands to the Derwent Valley. The dream was to make Tasmania a magnet for industry, attracted to the state by the prospect of cheap power, to create thousands of jobs. The most remarkable expansion of Tasmania's hydropower scheme occurred during the 1930s depression, when money was tight and materials scarce. The hydro had to find ways to address a looming electricity supply crisis, and in 1934, a newly elected state government used an act of parliament to fast track work on the Taralea scheme. 1,500 people were employed over the life of that scheme. While it was a boon for employment, the hastily prepared work camps offered little protection from the elements and nothing in the way of home comforts. Mercury newspaper correspondent Joe Coburn was a regular visitor to hydro camps in the 1930s and wrote about the conditions he found there. How they existed in that winter weather, I don't know. But the people who went up there were generally in poor circumstances. You see, they simply had to go to Taralea because it was either that or starve. Throughout the Second World War, work continued on the Taralea scheme and working conditions gradually improved. From tents to shared huts to single men's barracks, the simple construction villages evolved eventually into whole new communities, attractive enough to entice women, families and new Australians. The influx of European migrants filled a desperate manpower shortage and changed the nature of the hydro workforce forever. George Krusika, now in his 90s, was a war veteran, one of more than 300 Polish rats of Tobruk, who signed up in England for a new life in Tasmania. In 1947, George and his army mates found themselves at Taralea. Without a formal trade, they were employed as labourers, wielding picks and shovels. George and his countrymen found ways to ease the hardship, at the same time evoking a little bit of home. We used to have a party every week, every month, you know, we used to call, used to call it the Bacchus party. They we used to cook the proper Polish dish, you know, and had a bit of drink, you know, and had a bit of singing, you know, what's it? And this, I was telling a fellow, he said, what's that? I said, it's made out of cabbage. Oh, that's poison, poison. <laughs> a keen musician, George pulled together others who'd brought musical instruments with them, and the Polish orchestra was born. The Diary of Paul Tutzauer, written in 1951, describes the experiences of four young German friends in Bronte Park, so different from the country and the culture they'd left behind. Dad often spoke of how good the food was there initially. In the, as soon as they arrived, he couldn't believe how much meat there was available. But they longed for something that they were used to, you know, sauerkraut, certain types of meats and, and so forth, and filtered coffee, would you believe, at the time. So an enterprising person started up his own business out of his hut. The food in the camp is getting worse. If you look at it, you don't feel hungry anymore. A German from Berlin who was a chef by profession had a brilliant idea and opened a little restaurant in one of the small huts. Unofficially, of course, the camp management doesn't know anything about it. Here in this little forbidden kitchen, you can eat German food. The single men's life in the camps was changing and by the 1950s, many more married couples were starting to live in hydro villages. I came to Taralia in 1951. I married a man, ex rat of Tobruk, who came to Australia in 1947. And we've met through the correspondence. 
I had choice to marry or not to marry. But apparently we liked each other. Uh, he was a very handsome man, I can say that. After eight years as a refugee in Africa, Danuta's life in Taralia changed dramatically. Would you believe it? For the first time in my life, after 10 years, I got a own house that I felt this is that I had space and first time that I could call it home, my own home. At its peak, more than 3,000 migrants from countries including Britain, Poland, Germany and Italy were recruited to Hydro's workforce. Many found themselves at Butler's Gorge working on the Clark Dam, captured here on the day of its last concrete pour, March 25th, 1949. With the socially changing boom years of the 1950s, the once primitive all-bachelor work camps had become thriving communities of their own. The ethos of the village at that time was excellent. Uh, the, it was a family-oriented thing. We had people from all over Europe. We made friends and uh, the, the village gained a lot from that. If you were invited to somebody's place for an evening, firstly you'd probably put a time, but we'd go to a nook normal house with normal lounge room and just sit about and somebody will say something and somebody and then an hour and a half later this, this has been going on all the time everybody's laughing themselves to death there was always things to talk about Modern electric, dirty great are out of style. Face the winter with a smile. Make the big switch this winter. Click on modern electric. By the 60s, the restraints of the war years were long gone and consumer demand for electricity was on the rise. Modern electric appliances made the drudgery of housework seem almost glamorous. From the late 1940s, Sir Alan Knight had been the driving force behind the hydro. He surrounded himself with capable staff equipped to drive the construction program needed to satisfy the huge appetite for electricity. The workforce grew fivefold to more than 5,000 people in the 1980s. During Sir Alan's 30 years at the helm of the business, the Hydro won international recognition for the advances it was making in dam and power station design and construction. And Hydro, for the first time, began to cultivate its own image, helped by artists such as Max Angus. The Hydro asked me to do their power booklets. They're illustrated with all the dams and uh, constructions in, in, in a way that the, the, that the ordinary person could understand. My job was to illustrate the production of power in the most powerful way that I could. This week, the construction boys working on Tasmania's Poatina hydroelectric scheme were looking pretty chuffed when a new world record was set by their latest tunnel digging toy, the mighty Robins Mole. Recently adapted at Hobart's Moona workshop to suit Tassie's rugged conditions, the mole last week chopped its way through an astonishing 675 feet 6 inches of solid rock over a six day working week. And she's not finished yet. Boy, look at her go. Well done lads, and well done to the mighty Robins Mole. By the 1970s, the Hydro was keen to warn potential immigrants of just where on earth it was they were going. I remember at the interview, um, they showed us this map, and I don't know where they had the map from, really, because it said, the, you know, the southwest area, it said unexplored on it. We were £10 poms. The Hydro were very particular that I had to go to the interview they certainly made the point of stressing that the weather was not particularly kind. I remember quite clearly they said, you know, you do understand that it rains a lot in Strathgordon. And I said, yes. I mean, I was only 24. I don't think I had a very clear idea of what it was that the place was going to be like. 
Hydro Village has had all the amenities. I mean, I, I can remember Poatini, uh, the swimming pool. You didn't have one swimming pool, you had three swimming pools. Then you had squash court, you had tennis court. Uh, it was just everything you required was there, plus you were um, close proximity to other families and that. We'd walk out the door as kids and uh, at nine o'clock, eight o'clock in the morning, and then you sort of made your own fun and done your own things around the village for the whole day and sort of come home before the street lights come on when used to be the general rule. But there's this, um, air of freedom that I don't think that our kids of today's generation sort of understand. You can guarantee if you deviated and uh, got yourself in a little bit of trouble that your mum and dad would know what you did before you got home. It was that real sense of everybody looking out for everybody. While Hydro kids had near unlimited freedom, the Hydro was still struggling with where women might fit, as wives or secretaries, but never both. Well, the people were very nice, but what I remember is a very conservative, hierarchical male environment overseeing the hydro business. The young men were streamed for management, young women were streamed to support rather than manage. When I married, I had to resign and reapply for the same job. And then I had to do it all over again when my son Jeremy was born. It was quite different back then. I, I can recall when I was working out at the motor transport department that at one stage I got banned from the workshop because the boys used to whistle or stir me up so they couldn't concentrate, so you couldn't go in there. So there was a bit of that, but it changed over time. It wasn't until 1982 that Virginia Stansby Hall became Hydro's first female apprentice. The times were definitely changing for the Hydro. By the 1960s, with the construction of roughly one dam a year, the scale of hydropower development in Tasmania was enormous. A significant period of economic growth and state development was overseen by the man who had become known as Electric Eric. Eric Rees had had his first experience with electricity in Launceston as a six-year-old. Forty years later, as Premier of Tasmania, he set out to bring electricity to homes in the dozens of tiny country towns across the state. It was he who thumbed his nose at the federal government and approved the flooding of Lake Pedder in southwest Tasmania to create one of the hydro's most important power schemes. The existing Lake Pedder, set in the centre of this huge, almost flat valley, will disappear when the water level is raised by 50 feet. The unique nature of the lake in its present form has stimulated the state government to produce this film to record its beauty before it disappears to make way for the greater Lake Pedder. I've painted Lake Pedder right up to the present time. I never, I've never stopped painting it. It would never happen in today's world that such a place would be destroyed, but uh, it, it did so happen. I looked at it from an engineering point of view and, and having Lake Pedder made a lot of sense in the um, producing the maximum amount of power from, from that area. Concern about the loss of Pedder's environmental values was the catalyst for the birth of the world's first green political party, the United Tasmania Group. And the flooding of Lake Pedder made Tasmania's fledgling environmental movement determined that next time it would not lose. Nearly ten years later, the increasingly organised environmental movement took its fight against hydro to the streets of Tasmania and to the river the hydro planned to dam to oppose the Gordon Below Franklin scheme. Jeff Lee was briefly a hydro worker, working on a drilling team, before he himself became part of the environmental movement. We used to get the dinghy out after work and go down the river around the bend and just groove on, on nature. So um, there was uh, three of us in the end that ended up on the blockade from that uh, investigation camp uh, in that summer of 79 when I was there. Well, early on, uh, it was normal investigation work, so there wasn't so much issue. But of course, as the campaign to stop the Lower Gordon Dam increased, um, there was a lot of tension within the workforce, and uh, some employees didn't really want to work on the project. In the early 1980s, when the world descended on the remote Franklin River, it was Chris Rackham who was given the task of fronting the international media for the hydro. In those days, it was the Wilderness Society, I think, who were running the thing. But I did admire them for the way they manipulated the media 
to get the greatest publicity for their cause. And they put on a demonstration at about 11 o'clock every morning, so it got the midday news, and then there'd be another one in the afternoon to get the evening news. You know, hard to sell um, concrete and bulldozers against images of great beauty. That's uh, sort of, it's always going to be a losing battle, I think. In the end, the battle over the Franklin Dam was settled in the High Court, which concluded that the Hawke government's federal powers outweighed Tasmania's rights as a state. The Hydro's era of dam construction was coming to an end. When I was at Strathgordon, we didn't know we were going to wind back construction at all. In those days, it was still looked as if we'd be going on doing scheme after scheme, but the more of the state that got locked up into national parks and um, World Heritage Area, the less um, options there were for developing hydropower. Oh, pretty devastated, obviously. Um, you know, from having a job one day to not having a, a job the next day, it, it, it knocks you around, certainly. With its long-term construction plans thrown into disarray, the hydro moved quickly to ensure those who would have been working on the Gordon scheme were not without employment. Work was brought forward on what would be the last major hydropower scheme in Tasmania, the Anthony Pyman scheme. In 1994, the last large-scale hydropower development built by Hydro Tasmania was commissioned, the aptly named Tribute Power Station. I think it was quite a shock to some people that that would be the last project. We had workshops uh, to help uh, explain and help people over the, this problem of the end of construction. And um, I came out of that feeling very positive, actually, because it, it showed me there were, we were actually moving on into another phase of Hydro Tasmania. But Hydro has definitely come on a big journey, um, a, a real shift in attitude, and um, I guess the older way of doing things could be described as arrogance, but it was a product of its time. Um, it was perfectly perfectly appropriate for its time and as society all around us changes, the hydro has gone on that change with, with our community. The bold thinking that had characterised the hydro was as important as ever in reinventing the business. Hydro power would always be at the centre of its operations, but with no new hydro schemes being built, the business had to move in new directions. Tapping one of the best wind resources in the world, Hydro Tasmania commissioned its first wind farm at Huxley Hill. More wind farms followed, including Muscle Row, Hydro's most ambitious wind project to date. The 90s also saw recognition from the Hydro that the skills of its people in hydropower development and other renewable technologies could be used outside Tasmania. Hydro's international consulting business, Entura, was born. Once the Anthony scheme finished, uh, uh, we felt that the skills that Hydro Tasmania had should be uh, kept within the organisation, and one of the best ways to do that was to uh, export our skills. I've worked in quite a few Southeast Asian countries. We've worked in some of the islands of the South Pacific. There's many things in our history that, that'll help other countries. I mean, what, what we did 100 years ago in uh, transforming uh, Tasmania's economy through electrification is what many emerging countries are, are seeking to do right now. It's amazing you sort of wake up and look around and you think all of a sudden I've not just made it to the city, I'm now you know, travelling international and, and, and are sharing that knowledge that I have with, uh, with other cultures. I guess the legacy that was you know, in its embryonic stages way back in the early 1900s has now morphed to something that's now transportable to other, other countries. It's, you know, that same probably ingenuity that, and that same spirit that we take forward. It's a fairly rare opportunity for a place the size of Tasmania to have an organisation that's doing um, work design um, processes that are as good as anywhere that you could find and often making them up themselves to a, to a degree of quality that you don't find everywhere else. I was often surprised in my travels working with other professionals at how proud I could feel of the way that we did things at the Hydro. Closer to home, there was more change. In 2006, the commissioning of the BassLink undersea cable between Tasmania and mainland Australia made it possible to send Tasmania's clean hydropower to the rest of the country. Soon after this, the Hydro, or Hydro Tasmania as it was now known, bought its own retail business, Momentum Energy, to take Tasmania's clean energy exports direct to market. Today, Hydro Tasmania is Australia's largest provider of renewable energy, each year generating more than twice as much power as the Snowy Mountain Scheme. 
Over the past century, it is estimated that between 25 and 30,000 people from all corners of the world have built Australia's leading renewable energy business. The vision of a handful of people 100 years ago has delivered far more than they must ever have dreamed. Tasmanians are very proud of what, of what the hydro has done in Tasmania, and, and rightly so. And, and, and we're going to make sure that they're going to be proud of what we do next as well. We have machines that have been around for 80 years and still uh, make electricity that we use uh, in, in all our computers and eye things. I think certainly in the future, I can see some of these stations continuing to, to be where we get our power from. And, I'm sure many more exciting new technologies will come along that we'll use as well. I'm sure that'll involve renewable energy in Tasmania, hydropower in Tasmania, and, uh, and with you know, people's concerns about the environment, renewable power will be more important over the next 100 years than, than ever. What children are very conscious of is how to have a low impact. That really is the key, I think, to, to energy in the future. It's how to get the, the lifestyle that you want with having a, a low impact. In the future, I think that we can generate electricity by harnessing the power of natural disasters, such as earthquakes and um, hurricanes and uh, tsunamis. Uh, lightning is made out of uh, certain gases. If we uh, manage to collect those certain gases and put them in a certain place, we uh, just might be able to make our own lightning which would, uh, of course, make electricity. I don't think this they thought of before, the log industry, like the waste of like the trees, you could dry them up and like put them into a big fire and like the electricity goes to like a big power station. Oh, in the future, I reckon they would have satellites orbiting the sun that would generate, uh, with solar panels, generating electricity for Earth. I thought we could use giant water wheels, um, have like a wind turbine, but instead of the blades have like a water wheel, stick that in the ocean and you could use the tide to create electricity. Between my grandfather, my father and myself, it'd be, yeah, over 50 years of, of uh, service, um, which, is, which has been great both ways. We've enjoyed working for Hydro, but we also feel that we've contributed uh, to hydro. Hopefully my kids I can say, well, I've worked on this, I've done that, or your pop done this, or your great pop done that. Yeah, I'm quite uh, happy with our achievements. And could be more yet, I'm still here. <laughs>